Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm George Guntas. You love The Daily Show for its incisive political commentary. But did you know that The Daily Show offices are filled with super soccer fans? I'm the lighting designer here at The Daily Show. And the only thing that I love more than the beautiful game is my wife and kids. Um, I'm joined here today by Daily Show writer and super soccer fan, Joe Opio. A pleasure always, George. It's been a few weeks since we last spoke, Joe. There's so much going on in the world of football. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. You know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm well rested. Uh, the batteries are recharged. We are back. It's already a great new year for soccer fans all over the world. We had a great past year. So I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Nice. I personally am having World Cup withdrawal, you know, after the whole tournament was just fantastic. The final was just box office. What a game. I mean, you know, after Argentina goes up 2-0 in the first half, you think it's going to be a comfortable uh, win. After 75 minutes, France decides to start playing. Kylian Mbappe uh, scores a brace in two minutes to force extra time. Argentina strike first in extra time. But then Mbappe, a late Mbappe penalty forces penalties. Drama in the penalties. Uh, Martinez was fantastic, and, and Argentina prevail, uh, putting a cap on a wonderful career for Lionel Messi. There's just so much to unpack here. Let's dive straight in. What are your thoughts on the game? Wow. Uh, boy, first of all, I'll agree with you, everyone. I think every soccer fan is having a very, very terrible World Cup withdrawal because the season restarted, but people are not yet as willing to get back into club football having witnessed how magical the World Cup can be. But yeah, we are slowly getting back in. Uh, my thoughts about the World Cup final, greatest World Cup final in the history of the game, without a doubt, a seesaw battle. And as you say, uh, you expected it to be a stroll in the park for Messi and company. But wow, what a pro twist at the end. I don't think any writer in Hollywood would have scripted this any better. It was full of pro, you know, dramatic pro, uh, pro twists. It was full of drama, it was full of intrigue, it was full of tension. It was so tense that at some point it stopped being enjoyable and it almost turned into uh, a soccer version of torture. Because for, <laughs> I think from the 78, because I was, of course, I was rooting for Messi. I'm of the view that football uh, owed Messi a World Cup. So from the 78th minute up to the end of the game, I wasn't having fun. It, yeah. it, 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 I think um, it might have shaved 10 years of yeah. my life expectancy. That's how bad and how tense that game was, like towards the end. But, you know, in hindsight, one of the greatest, greatest games, without a doubt, I've ever had the pleasure of watching. Of course. And the, what also made it fantastic was it was huge performances from the biggest players. Messi with a brace, Mbappe with a hat-trick, Di Maria put in a man of the match performance. Uh, uh, then also uh, Martinez, the goalkeeper for Argentina. What, what, what a what personality, a yeah. what a character. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. So, it, you know, it it uh, leaves you wanting uh, more international football. Like you said, we'll, we'll get to more of the, of the, of the club football uh, later. But you, Joe, uh, were living your best life in Qatar, uh, rubbing elbows with the likes of David Beckham and Didier Drogba. What was it like to be there? Oh boy, I, I and I think I've talked to friends about this. Like I'm, I'm a guy who cares. Who thought? Yeah. Well, I think I still do. Who cares about human rights? So mm -hmm. when I went to Qatar, I didn't expect. I shouldn't have enjoyed it mm -hmm. the way I did. It mm -hmm. basically left me going like, do I maybe not care about human rights the way I should be. Should I be more woke? But that's how enjoyable this World Cup was. And I wasn't the only one having that conflicted uh, uh, view of the World Cup. There were many soccer fans. There were many soccer legends. Didier Drogba, David Beckham, Lude Hullit. I ran into all these players. And they were all so having the same feeling. They were going like, is it supposed to still be this enjoyable despite everything surrounding it? But it was a great World Cup. You can't uh, deny Qatar that. It was probably the best World Cup in living memory, at least the one I've watched. And, I, and these soccer legends have watched like World Cups before. And they also testified to the fact that this was, there were so many surprises. From the moment that Argentina lost to Saudi Arabia, we were off and running. And it didn't stop. It didn't let up. You know, all the games, Brazil, Croatia, dramatic. Uh, England, France, Ken missing a penalty at the date, dramatic. Uh, Argentina, Netherlands, that free kick, creative free kick by the Netherlands, yeah. force extra time, dramatic. The games where Japan beat both Spain and Germany 
Mm-hmm. It, it was like drama, drama. It felt like there was a Qatari script writer mm-hmm. just going like, okay, now we need another twist. Yeah. Now the audience is getting a bit used to it. We need another twist. And it was, and as you said, you know, I rubbed the elbows with all the legends. It was, uh, I think for me, the experience was, if you're a soccer fan, uh, this was like a once in a lifetime opportunity and a once in a lifetime experience. I enjoyed every bit of it. And I'm also happy for one thing. At least I showed more restraint, more restraint than Salt- <laughs> Saltberry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, look, I embarrassed myself, but I didn't go viral. So, <laughs> so at least, at least, because there's only one rule when you yeah. go to these uh, matches and you happen to run into these legends, yeah. you can go Salt Bay, but you can never go full salt bay and so <laughs> at least you know that i have that going for me i think the other thing the world cup taught me is <laughs> the other lesson is that life comes at you fast right? right because life can humble you because i spent two weeks hanging with football royalty and royalty royalty because i was also hanging with you know i was watching from the sky boxes with the princes and the emirs like brothers and all that and now look what i'm doing here I am doing a podcast with George. That's what right. a downgrade. Yeah. Yeah. What a downgrade. Well, oh my God. <laughs> this, and what? <laughs> no, this is the, I feel like this is the biggest fall from grace. Going right, from Joe. hanging with like football royalty and royalty royalty to hanging with, uh, you know, with all due respect to <laughs> hanging with you, George. This is like the biggest, <laughs> it's the biggest fall from grace since, since, since Andrew Tate decided <laughs> to tweet, to tweet at Greta Thunberg. Like, like life comes at you fast. At one point oh. I was living my life and now, I've yeah. crushed right down. Oh my back. goodness! So very, very humbling. That's, That's uh, the big moral lesson from Qatar. Yes. Oh my god! And well, Joe, and Joe, Joe's living his best life in Qatar with royalty. Uh, my World Cup final was definitely not as glamorous. I'm going to share a quick personal story. Uh, so, my kids have had their Greek school winter pageant where they sing their Greek songs oh. at the at the church at 11 a.m. on Sunday of the game. The legend. Who? Scheduled this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, 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 like, that's, that's, that's like a treasonable offense. Who was scheduled? Yeah. A kid's recital pageantry, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, my God. Okay. And, and, the, and the person who's the legend is my father because he had the gall to ask both my mother and my wife, is it cool if George and I stay and watch the game? And, and you know, and that, they went we, <laughs> no. so, so we, yeah. the agreement was basically we're going to watch the first half. So the first 45, we're going to shoot in. I get So there. it was your daughter or... Both the daughters. Cup final. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and so and so we we shoot into the city. We're watching the start of the second half on the game. At the 65th minute, I go in the church. This church service is running long, and uh, and my dad's like, "I'm going to stay out in the car and watch on the phone until you you text me when." <laughs> so my dad's watching the game. I go in. I text perfect, him. As, perfect grandfather. Yeah, perfect my, my grandfather. My dad's like, I text him to come in. He walks in. I'm like, I'm like, Argentina lock it up, and he's like, Mbappe scored twice in two minutes. End of it's end of full time. I'm like, do you pause it? He's like, yeah. So we oh, they do the they, they do they do the recital. We take some photos. We shoot out. We don't see anybody because the game was still going on. There were no like flags in the street yet. So we sprinted home and watched the last. We rewinded the game to like the 65th minute where I stopped and then turned all notifications on and watched the rest of the game. But it was a tense, a tense couple of hours in the church. I'm sure it's some sort of sin. Uh, but but we got we well, got through it. Yeah, I, I was rubbing elbows with the royalty. You are rubbing <laughs> elbows with priests. So I think I right. win this. Uh, but yeah. also, I think well, on the bright side, at least your daughter knows how much you That's love right. her. Your daughter That's knows right. how much her granddad loves her. That's right. And I can imagine your dad. I can imagine your dad walking in and going like Mbappe scored twice, and you had to see it to believe it. <laughs> yeah. And mean, no, like ah, uh, whoever scheduled that oh, is man, it, it, an enemy. Of the beautiful yeah. game. Oh, it was it was insane, and like I said, it took every ounce of restraint to not turn it on during the church service. Uh, but that that was that. Uh, glad to hear you had a wonderful time in Qatar, and it's great to have you back, Joe, as always. Um, but there is some sad news that uh, unfolded um, over the break oh, yeah. while we while we were gone. Brazilian legend uh, Pele, winner of three World Cups and arguably uh, the greatest player to ever play the game, passed away at the age of eighty two after a long battle with uh, colon cancer. He played nineteen seasons with Santos in Brazil. And three seasons with the New York Cosmos, uh, including friendlies. He scored 1,279 goals in 1,363 appearances, if you include friendlies. What a legend. Incredible numbers, unbelievable numbers, uh, potentially unrepeatable numbers. And you know, I love Messi, and uh, we grew up 
you know, mm. Wash being uh, the great two, uh, that's Pele and Maradona. We didn't have, um, I didn't have, I can't speak to how old you are, but I didn't have the pleasure mm. or honor of watching uh, Pele. I watched Maradona in 94 when he came to uh, the US for the World Cup, but that, of course, yeah. ended in disgrace with, you know, with the doping scandal and all that. Yeah. But I had stories about uh, a Pele. I had like, incredible, magical stories about Pele, fantastic stories. I watched clips of Pele and it's almost hard to put into words what Pele accomplished as a player. Because Pele won Brazil, its yeah. first World Cup. Everyone thinks of Brazil now as this soccer giant, this soccer powerhouse. But before Pele came onto the scene, Brazil had never won a World Cup, which is unfathomable now because they have the most at yeah. five. But he won them their first World Cup in 1958 in Sweden. And the craziest detail from that World Cup is Pele was 17. Right. Pele was 17 and he led Brazil. He wasn't carried. He carried Brazil to the World Cup in 58 and he did this at 17 as a teenager. Scored six goals in four games. That's unthinkable. In this day and age, if a player did that, if a teenager did that, just think how much their worth would be. And so Pele was a big deal. And that's the other thing that people don't get. Pele was a big deal. I'm a fan of Messi, but I'm in awe when it comes to how big Pele was. Pele was a big deal pre-current TV. He was a big deal pre-computers. He was a big deal pre-social media. So Messi and Ronaldo are big, but they have been fueled by the information age. Pele was a huge deal back then when information wasn't as global and the world wasn't as small a village as it is now. And it's almost hard to put into words how big Pele was, but I'll just use an anecdote to tell some of our maybe younger fan, younger listeners or younger viewers how big Pele was. Pele once avoided getting robbed at gunpoint in Brazil because the thieves noticed who he was and they respected how big he was. Mm. Like, just imagine how crazy and how big that is. Because Pele, he was in a chauffeur-driven Mercedes mm. in Brazil, uh, in, in Sao Paulo, and then he stops at the red light and these people jump out, two thieves, and they try to mug him. And of course, because Pele used to wear a cap, a baseball, a baseball cap, so that he, he couldn't get recognized. Because remember, he was a big deal. He was like a god mm. in Brazil. And so the thieves, when they put the driver at gunpoint, they said, hey, occupants in the car. Pele was in with his wife at the time. Please give us your valuables, give us your money, and then you will leave. No one needs to get hurt. And Pele put off the baseball cap, and they recognized him. And they immediately gave him a thumbs up, apologized, and turned and walked away yeah. without taking a thing. That's how big this guy was. Think of how many players would enjoy that kind of respect from mm. people who have come to mug you at gunpoint in this time age. But that just gives you almost a view or a perception of how larger than life Pele was. And I think even if like we celebrated him, I don't think he got... Uh, the kind of respect he deserved from like the younger fans, because our grand, probably like your dad, our elder, mm. our elders respect him way more than. And I think, uh, funny enough, the circle will come around because probably in 2050 there's going to be a younger kid who will be like killing it, and then we'll be trying to tell our kids and the grand our grandkids how big Messi was, how good Messi was, mm. and they won't get the same kind of respect. But Messi and Ronaldo have the have the, 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 what you'd call the gift of at least having played at a time when almost all their games were televised. So we'll be able to show evidence. But I don't think Pele, because we didn't see all Pele's games, all Pele's games were not televised, we only saw the highlights. I don't think we've got to appreciate just how good Pele was. Oh, abs- absolutely. Um, you know, and one of his bigger contributions outside of Brazil, uh, I think in 1975, after 19 years at Santos, uh, he came to the New York Cosmos in the North American Soccer League. And really, um, he's, he's kind of credited for sparking kind of the growth of interest. And, made and, Americans and, fall and, in love. And, and, and made, yeah. made Americans fall in love with the beautiful game. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, still seeing the, uh, the effects of that, uh, of such a global star. Like, imagine, you know, Michael Jordan went to a different country where basketball wasn't popular and just made it uh, and brought exposure to the sport. It was... Uh, but even bigger globally. Probably one of his biggest contributions to the game off the pitch. 
was actually yeah. making Americans because yeah. you can actually draw a line between yeah. Perry arriving at New York Cosmos and the US hosting the World Cup in 1994. Right. Because most of the kids who ended up filling the stadium mm -hmm. in 1994 were kids who grew up and started loving the game because their parents saw Pele play for the New York Cosmos. Yeah, it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. We got to take a quick break. We'll be right back after this. Unfortunately, uh, this growing exposure of, uh, of football in America has led to kind of some bad headlines for the U.S. men's national team uh, involving a, a blackmail scandal. Uh, and um, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to give you a quick recap of what's, what's uh, going on in the headlines. Uh, this all started at the World Cup when arguably one of the uh, U.S. men's national team's great, uh, best, most skilled players, Gio Reyna, um, was kind of surprisingly uh, left out of the lineup in the total in a total of four, uh, three group stage games and one knockout game. He played Something we talked about at yeah. length, by the way, yeah, in, our, yeah. in our past podcasts. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He played a total of only four, 53 minutes in four games. And it was, you know, kind of leaked. Everyone knew that he was he was fit and he was, uh, you know, and he was one of their best players. So it was clearly there was something up with the manager or something. Something was up. Uh, but, you know, so since then, um uh, uh, coach uh, Greg Berhalter was at like a leadership conference where he made, I think what he thought were off the record comments that then became public where he described the situation in Qatar without uh, naming Gio by name, but this information leaked. Uh, this is what was said in the last world cup. We had a player that was clearly not meeting expectations on and off the field. Berhalter said one of 26 players. So it stood out as a staff. We sat together for hours deliberating. What were we going to do with this player? We were ready to book a plane ticket home for him. That's how extreme it was. And what it came down to was we're going to have one more conversation with him. And part of that conversation was how we're going to behave from here on out. There aren't going to be any more infractions. OK, so that's a, a snippet from the statement. And then again, I have never to say, sorry yeah. for jumping in, but it was yeah. a bit naive in this yeah. day and age for Greg to think it won't leak. I know he made yeah. this at a conference uh, yeah. and I think he was talking about moral leadership and he didn't think, it, yeah. it was a private conference, but in this day and age like of social media and people recording hmm. and phones, I yeah. don't think you can say anything to a crowd of more than 10 people and you think it's going to stay private. So Greg, Shame a him, bit man. naive, and, and, and no, just a bit naive of him to think it won't leak. Agreed, agreed. And then obviously everyone knew who he was talking about. And Gio Reyna himself uh, acknowledged this and he uh, thought he had to make a statement and he did on Instagram. And a snippet from that is just before the World Cup, Coach Burhalter told me that my role at the tournament would be very limited. I was devastated. I am someone who plays with pride and passion. Soccer is my life and I believe in my abilities. I fully expect and desperately want to continue to the play of a talented group as we tried to make a statement at the, at the World Cup. I am a very emotional person and I fully acknowledge that I let my emotions get the best of me and affect my training and behavior for a few days after learning about my limited role. I apologize to my teammates and the coach for this and I was told I was forgiven. Thereafter, I shook off my disappointment and gave everything I had on and off the field. Then it starts to get a little crazy, Joe. It, it was just, again, <laughs> to jump in, uh, yeah. disappointing yeah. from Gio, the attitude, yeah. uh, because when a coach makes a decision as a player, you're supposed, I didn't agree. Hmm. And I think I made this very clear in the past yeah. podcasts. I didn't agree with Greg's decision. I think uh, Gio Reyna should have been the cornerstone uh, of the US team. I think him and Pulisic are the most talented players in that team. And it, it was a bit um, of a letdown to see how limited his role was. But as I said, a bit disappointing, the attitude problems from Gio Reyna. But we have to remember, he's a 20-year-old player. Yeah. And he acknowledged that he's very emotional. And if you're as talented a player as he is, and this is your first World Cup, you come in thinking you're going to play a major role. And then you're, of course, consigned to like a bit part role. It can get disappointing. But he brushed, as he said, you know, he pulled his socks up. The senior players talked to him. But I can't see how disappointing and toxic it can be in a World Cup setting to have a team who is not a, a teammate who is not pulling his weight because he's disappointed that he didn't get the role he deserves. No, for, for sure. So obviously, this seems like a typical thing that would happen on a, on many football teams. Uh, star players are benched for many reasons and are unhappy about their lack of playing time. But this story takes a twist and it starts to get a little crazy because on Tuesday, it seems to get ahead of a, a potential story. Uh, Greg Berthalter posted a long statement on an unverified uh, Twitter account. Uh, 
about a domestic dispute claim between himself and his wife, Rosalind, that took place in 1991. Uh, quote, during the World Cup, an individual contacted U.S. soccer saying that they had information about me that would take me down, an apparent effort to, to leverage something very personal from long ago to bring out about the end of my relationship with U.S. soccer. In the fall of 1991, I met my soulmate. I had just turned 18 and I was a freshman in college when I met Rosalind. One night, while out drinking at a local bar, Rosalind and I had a heated argument and continued outside. It became physical and I kicked her in the legs. Rosalind left him after the incident, according to Bert Halter, and they worked through their issues and rekindled their relationship seven months later. Since then, they have been married for 25 years and have four children together. USA Soccer has launched a formal investigation into the matter and named Anthony Hudson as the head coach for at least the January U.S. Men's National Team camp. Burhalter's contract expired on December 31st and has yet to be renewed. It was a crazy, <laughs> it was a crazy post. Yeah. One, because as you said, it was all an unverified account. Yeah. So Greg clearly felt he had to get ahead of the news. And, you know, with, of course, Elon Musk saying people have to pay $8 to get verified. <laughs> you, you know, with the misinformation and everything, at first you didn't know yeah. how legit uh, yeah. this post was. It turned out to be very legitimate. And, um, yeah, things just snowballed from there, didn't they? Yeah, they sure did. So yeah. where did this come from? Well, I'll tell you where it came from. It came from Gio Reyna's mom. In a statement to Fox Sports, Gio Reyna's mom, Danielle, says she reported the 1991 domestic violence to the U.S. men's national team of, of, of Greg Burhalter to the USSF sporting director Ernie Stewart after Burhalter's post-World Cup comments on Gio. She later clarified, I want to be very clear that I did not ask for Greg to be fired. I did not make any threats and I did not know anything about any blackmail attempts. Another relevant thing to this is that uh, during this time, Danielle Reyna and uh, Rosalind Burhalter were uh, teammates at the University of North Carolina on the same maybe before, uh, college maybe, soccer team as well, yeah. Maybe for, before you even get into the yeah. relationship entanglements of the parties yeah. involved, yeah. Yeah. it's worth noting that the blackmail aspect yeah. almost turns this criminal, which right. is why it was so shocking when right. Greg said this was an attempt to take him down, that they had information to take him down, and which is why it was so critical for Gio's mom to say, I did not try to threaten to, to threaten right. or have him fired. I just expressed uh, disappointment because that's what she did. So the thing is, she knows the head of all, one of the top guys in U.S. soccer. And so she said it's hypocrite. What, what she, from her statement, because this is a he said, she said kind of uh, story. From her statement, she makes clear that she didn't want Greg fired. What she did was she was disappointed that despite Gio asking for forgiveness and apologizing, Greg hadn't extended the same grace to him that was extended to Greg when he apologized for his mistakes in the past. Because Greg made the mistake of, you know, uh, of course, assaulting his future wife when he was 18, which is basically around the same age that mm. Gio is. Gio is 20. And so Gio's mom felt it was a bit hypocritical that Greg wasn't extending the same amount of grace and forgiveness to Gio that he was extended when he was also a young man who let his emotions get the better of him. Hmm. And so she said she actually contacted U.S. Soccer because she was saying, I hope this is the last statement Greg makes about the situation because right. my son is being attacked online. My son is being issued with death, death threats from like all sorts of accounts. So she said she did it to protect her son. But as I said, you know, it's a bit of he said, she said, and it's, it's, it's all very murky, but yeah. Yeah. Then there's, and, of course, the relationship aspect, which even takes it into soap opera territory now. Yeah, so now it, it gets even more uh, crazy. So the other element to this is Gio's dad, Claudio Reyna, is a U.S. Uh, soccer team legend. Uh, he is... Uh, so the U.S. captain? He was, yeah, and he used to play... He was a teammate of Greg Berhalter as well. Two World uh, Cups together. Right, exactly. So mm -hmm. not only were they close teammates, but, you know, my understanding is that both families were close family friends. Um, and so then... It, you know, ESPN has reported that Claudio Reyna uh, threatened to share allegations about Burr Halter, though Claudio Reyna denies these claims. Um, but he does admit to voicing his frustration with other senior officials at U.S. soccer, other teammates mm -hmm. uh, of his, uh, you know, from back in his playing days. So this is just just insane. Uh, it's some next level kind of soccer mom shit. Like, what are your I, thoughts on I, the whole I, thing? I, <laughs> Yeah. I'll say this. So I've seen most of the reaction, especially yeah. from the U.S., you know, soccer pandit class yeah. who are, you know, people who 
I would say journalists and also former players hmm. who have kind of vested interest or like conflicted interest because they know the parties, they're close to the parties involved. No. And most of the reaction has been, this is a sad indictment on U.S. soccer. This is a dark chapter, a tragic, tragic day in U.S. soccer. This moment shouldn't be happening. And I get that. Totally get it because anytime anything involves, first of all, families and kids, and also involves, you know, domestic violence, it's a very serious and tragic event. Hmm. I get that. But the comedian in me thinks everyone is missing the big picture. The comedian in me, the com for me, my, uh, as a comedic premise, I think people are not thinking outside the box. Because, George, if you think about it, if you think about it, this scandal could be the best thing. Actually, not could be. Is hands down the best thing that has ever happened to U.S. soccer. How's you know, that? Forget Pele coming in the seventies. Forget the nineteen ninety four World Cup. Forget uh, the launch of the the launch of the MLS. Forget even the twenty twenty six World Cup, which is coming up. This is the best best thing. This scandal for me, yeah. Yeah. George, marks a turning point in U.S. soccer. All right, I'll buy it. How, how's that? And I, yes, I know you think it's crazy, but <laughs> just think about it. Yeah. The drama. Yeah. The intrigue, the suspense, the he said, she said, the insane plot twist we've been experiencing these past 48 hours. Yeah. That's everything you want in a soap opera. That's yeah. it, it, it. This is like a soap opera. This is like a telenovela, yeah. American style, but on steroids as well. So for me, this is good for US soccer because Americans are addicted to drama. Americans love reality TV. And this is the first time I think that US soccer has trended outside of the World Cup for this right. long. At least U.S. men's soccer has yeah. trended for this long. So this, for me, the reality TV element of it, I think is a huge, huge boon uh, for U.S. soccer. This is like the Kardashians meet Jesse Smollett, meets the <laughs> Real Housewives. It's got everyone gripped. It has everyone captivated, yeah. everyone online. Even yeah. accounts who have never shown any interest in soccer yeah. are getting involved because of the drama in it. This is like, this, this, this is like, it, it should be on Bravo. It shouldn't be on Twitter. It should be on Bravo. This is the first time that a story, I think on US soccer, is actually making headlines on TMZ. That's fantastic. And for me, this, this, this is like a crossover moment uh, yeah. for US soccer. Suburban moms now all of a sudden care. And why do they care? It's because, one, this is a relatable scandal. Because, mm -hmm. of course, the soccer mom hmm. is a well-known cliche in America. So all yeah. the suburban moms go like, yes, we would have done the same for our son. If a coach was messing with our son, we would also leak information about him. And then it's also relatable because, George, as I said, Americans are addicted to drama and the relationship aspects of the parties involved in this scandal are just off the charts. As you said, the only way Gio's mom knew about this domestic assault, domestic uh, violence incident is because she was a roommate yeah. to Greg's wife. Yeah. They were not just roommates at the University of North Carolina. They were actually teammates mm. on the soccer team. So that's how she knows about this. Yeah. And then, of course, the relationship between the two men is even more intriguing because yeah. not only were they high school teammates, yeah. They actually played in two World Cups together. Uh, Claudio Reyna was the captain. Greg later went on to become the coach. And not just that, he's the kicker. Claudio Reyna was the best man at Greg Beralta's wedding to Lozari. <laughs> that's insane. That, 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 that's how convoluted and that's how, that, that, that's how like intermixed and that's how dramatic and that's how this is it's, it's like something out of like a tabloid or something out of like a romantic it's, it's, it's like something out of a telenovela and i think if you're a u.s soccer mom who's not interested in soccer if you are a u.s um if you're an american who thinks soccer is boring well you have to think again because this drama just shows that it's not and for me it's also very relatable because it's very very american yeah, that's what I'm saying. This, this is, is, it is so a uniquely American. American. Yeah, it's yeah. a uniquely American thing because yeah. it, it almost reminds me of... Because American parents are always willing to do anything right. 
to help their kids succeed. They're right. willing to do anything. Most American parents are willing to do anything. You know, right. terms like snowplow parent, terms like helicopter parent, those are all American terms. We don't have those terms outside in the right. rest of the world. <laughs> and so this almost reminds me of the university, you know, the college admission scandal. Yeah, Aunt Becky. Aunt, yeah, Aunt Becky from Full House, like, yeah. you know, falsifying the accomplishments of her kids so they could get into uh, the University of South Carolina, of, uh, South Carolina, uh, USC. So for me, this, this is a uniquely American, like, dramatic scandal. And it's also very American in the sense that it's very capitalistic because America yeah. is, like, the hotbed of capitalism. And mm. capitalism, one thing we all know about capitalism is it... It really fuels a win at all costs mentality. Doesn't matter how many people you take down, doesn't matter how many people you step over, so long as you succeed in the end. And this story has that. And so for me, I think um, it, it also makes me realize I didn't know Americans cared about the beautiful game this much. Right. Because there are some people who are like, oh, America doesn't care about soccer. Well, it cares enough about soccer to blackmail the national team coach. Not even in Brazil do yeah. national team coaches get blackmailed so that the Suns of some parents get playing time. And for me, George, um, that's why I'm saying this is a turning point. This is a good thing. From yeah. a comedic standpoint, of course, I know it involves like serious issues like domestic violence, but from a comedic perspective, yeah. this is a great thing for U.S. soccer. And I think U.S. Yeah. soccer should be celebrating this moment instead of trying to play it down. Right. That's what I think. I think there should be a big promotional push. You know, yeah. just U.S. soccer using this scandal to just yeah. promote the game to Americans. Yeah. I, I can imagine like taglines like soccer, so addictive, it will make you betray your best friend. <laughs> so, so, soccer is so addictive, it will make you backstab your best friend just so that you can get in some of the action. That's a, for me, that's I think uh, what US soccer should be doing. They should be capitalizing on this instead of treating it like some shameful episode. This is a blessing in disguise. Yeah, I mean that that's a, a, a very a very funny take. I mean, it's it's so insane to me that a woman like the, that that Gio's mom would use the trauma of. I mean, again, this is serious stuff. It's serious like, because this is it's this, serious. This, because this, this, yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. very serious because part, yeah. for me, part of the and you've talked about trauma. Part of the yeah. thing that makes it very grave is she has forced, and of course, she says she didn't mean for it to go this far. But again, yeah. like Greg being naive, thinking the moment was private right. and this moment, his um, comments wouldn't leak. This was very naive from Gio's mom to think that it wouldn't escalate like this. Because the moment US soccer heard about this, they had to launch an investigation and then you need to leak to the press. But as we said, very grave situation because kids, some, you know, as I, as I said, Greg later, you know, made up with his. Uh, uh, then girlfriend, they are now married for 25 years. They have four yeah. kids and they're being yeah. forced to leave this publicly. Yeah. But yeah, again, George, I'll say this from a comedic standpoint, this yeah. is a lifetime movie. This yeah. is a lifetime movie from a comedic standpoint. Yeah. If you get a studio with a good enough budget, oh, this man. could actually be Oscar bait. <laughs> this could be Oscar bait. You know, because it could do to, it could do for US soccer what Tanya Harding. Absolutely. Did for US figure <laughs> skating. Just think yeah. about it. Tanya yeah. Harding, you know, trying to break Nancy Kerrigan's uh, knees yeah. becomes this big thing. Yeah. Later, there was even a movie, I, yeah. Tanya. I Tanya. Yeah. Great movie, great yeah. acting all around. Margot Robbie. I think I could actually, if, if, if this scandal was to be made into a movie, yeah. I can already cast the movie. I can Who's see it? who will play who in this film. I can who see Margot got? Robbie. I can see my girl be playing both women because she's very, very versatile. Uh, she's extremely versatile. She can, she can play both women. I can yeah. see Apo Bethany, who yep. plays Vision in uh, Avengers. I can see him playing Greg Belhalter. Nice. And then I think, of course, you have Timothy Charame, who would play Gio Reyna. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's box office goal. <laughs> and I think, I, I think Paul Giamatti. I would, yeah. I would cast Paul, <laughs> Paul Giamatti, Giamatti as Gio Reyna. And I think we have an Oscar. You mean Claudia Reyna? Uh, yes, sorry, as Claudio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, as, as as the father of Gio. And I yeah. think we have an Oscar winning picture on our hands. Oh, oh my God. This, this, this for me, and again, I have yeah. to, I, I say this because I know it's a serious matter, but I'm saying from a comedic standpoint. Oh, man. Because yeah. I'll leave it to the serious pundits uh, yeah. uh, uh, and you know, domestic violence experts to like pick apart how serious and grave this is. But for me, from a comedic standpoint, this is an 
Oscar-winning movie waiting to happen. I mean, uh, executives at Paramount Plus, um, you heard it here first. This is the bitch. Um, yes. You know, million one... dollar idea <laughs> do not steal. Yeah. I personally thought that the U.S. soccer uh, should not have renewed his contract based on his uh, team selection and tactics. He should have been sacked. Yes, he should have been. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay. So now, all of a sudden, even if there were people who were in his corner that thought he should continue, clearly now it's untenable. It's yeah. it's 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 yeah. So it's it, you know, it's only a matter of time where he's there. The the formal investigation, uh, investigation runs its course, and they they're probably going to search for a new. I'll say this. I'll say this no. for me. Uh, without even all this drama and the cloud hanging over this. As a coach, the moment you almost admit that you can't integrate your most talented player into your team, that's a suckable offense. That's yeah. a suckable offense. As I said in past podcasts, this would be like the Argentina coach admitting that he has to put Messi on the bench because for some reason he can't build a team around Messi. You can never hear the Brazilian coach saying, I can't build the team around Neymar. You can never hear the Portuguese coach during Ronaldo's prime. Hmm. admitting that he couldn't integrate from uh, Ronaldo into the team. So for me, just that admission by Greg Beralta was a suckable offense. And that's before we get into... He did a lot for US Soccer, but I think he had run hmm. uh, his course. And I think at some point, divorce was imminent. And I think this is just the last straw that should push this unholy and sad marriage between Greg Beralta and US Soccer to its inevitable conclusion. Uh, for sure. And for sure, you did mention Ronaldo in that last little tidbit. And I think it'll take us back to the Middle East where Cristiano Ronaldo... But, 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 yeah. maybe, but maybe yeah. before, sorry, uh, again sorry. to interrupt, maybe before we get into that, there have been questions, like serious soccer fans I know are very, very concerned about what this means for Gio Reyna. Right. With such parents, can Gio Reyna's career, can Gio Reyna's career with the US men's national team continue? He's just 20. He's the most skilled, hands down, most talented U.S. soccer player ever. And so people are wondering how this will affect his career with the national team going forward. And I think it shouldn't. I think Giorina should still be an integral part uh, mm. of um, U.S. soccer. I think he's still young and I think he learned his lesson. I think the fact that he was willing to step up and apologize yeah. before his teammates was a good sign of his maturity. He's still young. At 20 in soccer, you're still young. You know, he's like a starter at Borussia Dokument. So he has a bit of an ego. You also don't get good as a player without having an ego. We remember Leo right. Messi. Yeah. You know, had a problem with Luis Enrique at the beginning of his, you know, at some time at Barcelona. All players, for you to become the best player in your age or in your generation, you have to have a bit of that chip on your shoulder. So I think it should affect his career. I think Dio Reina is, of course, as I, as, I keep, as I keep harping on, he's the most talented player in the whole U.S. history. He just happens, maybe, maybe to have crazy parents. But then, who of us does it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, look at you, George. Your dad almost missed his daughter's pageant because he was watching so <laughs> in the parking lot. No, I'm, so I'm saying, you know, he's the most talented player. He might have crazy parents. Hey, no one is perfect. Yeah. No one is perfect. So I think this shouldn't, I think the sins of the parents, the sins of the father and mother shouldn't be visited onto the sun or shouldn't be like passed on to the sun. And I think Gio Reyna, this has been an embarrassing episode, the most embarrassing episode in his career. And also we've seen him, we've followed Gio Reyna at Borussia Document. He has never had this kind of problem before. So it's not like he has, this is a pattern of behavior yeah. that we've seen happen. This is the first time this is happening. And I think, yeah, I think we should extend him the same grace that uh, society should and must extend young Greg Beralta for what he did, we shouldn't condemn him. It wasn't, again, his fault. It was his parents. You have, everyone has crazy parents. And I think he should be able to continue his career with the U.S. Because him not continuing would be not just robbing him of the pleasure and honor of, you know, uh, representing your country, but it would be robbing the U.S. soccer fans, the long-suffering U.S. soccer fans of watching one of the most brilliant talents in world football. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see whoever the new manager may be, how he helps move the serve over and keep uh, harmony in the locker room moving forward. Hopefully, with uh, with Geo being a big part of what the future team is. Well, I think the first decision the U the new U S coach, and that's if Greg is not renewed. I think the first thing, uh, the first act the U the the new potential new U S coach should do is to file a restraining order 
against the Reina family. <laughs> yes, against the Reina family. Please keep them as far away because you need the parents to stay as far away. These yeah. problems about selection and playing time, they should be sorted between the player and the manager. Of course. Uh, the players' parents should be nowhere near uh, that setup because they're too emotional and they're too invested. So this is like, you know, we see this happening in US youth soccer, but the World Cup is just simply too high an event, too big an event for you to have this kind of amateurish tactics or amateurish, like, you know, uh, behavior, uh, clouding what should have been like a great curtain raiser for what US is going, the U.S. is going to do in 2026. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, like I said before, we're going to now turn it back to the Middle East and Saudi Arabia, where Cristiano Ronaldo signs a two and a half year deal worth Upwards, if you include commercial agreements, upwards of two hundred million a year for Saudi. I water, I water yeah, amounts. Yeah, for Saudi Arabian club Al Nasser, uh, is this a fitting final chapter for Cristiano Ronaldo's career? Well, I'll say this, George. I'm always happy to go back to the Middle East. Uh, I can see why Cristiano Ronaldo decided to go back. They were, frankly, Qatar was very was was an experience. And uh, but talking about this move in particular, of course. Uh, is it? No, it's not. No, it's not. I think Cristiano Ronaldo deserved better. Um, I've always, in the Cristiano Ronaldo-Messi debate, you know, I've always been Messi, but I think uh, Cristiano Ronaldo was a good rival. Uh, I think um, Cristiano Ronaldo has given soccer fans very, very, very precious, memorable moments. And I think his, um, his, his career deserved a better coda than this. I think I should have ended on a high. I think I would have liked him I would have liked to see him at least win another Champions League or maybe another title. And when he left Real Madrid, I didn't think uh, the slide down would be this quick and this steep because he went to Juventus and he had a great time, but then it didn't end well. He went to Manchester United, which was amazing, which was like something that every football fan, I don't care if you're from Messi or from Ronaldo, this is something you wanted because it was basically Ronaldo returning home. You know, he might not have been returning to sporting, but it was him returning home. And it started well enough. And, you know, he scored some big goals. He was their top scorer in that first season. But then it quickly fell apart when uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer left as coach because the new coach demanded that everyone contributes the same, mm. uh, which I think as a coach has its downsides because Ronaldo doesn't have um, the limbs. You know, 37-year-old legs won't track back the way 18-year-old legs will. And so Ronaldo suffered because of, because of that. And because Ronaldo, Ronaldo's game is all about scoring goals. When he wasn't scoring, then his um, weaknesses and his uh, flaws were even cast in grimmer light. So I think I would have liked to see him come to the U.S. or maybe, you know, because I'm, I'm best here. And I think he's huge in the U.S. I think he might even be bigger than Messi in the U.S. And I think it would have been a treat uh, for his diehard fans in the U.S. Or at least I would have loved to see him return to Portugal mm -hmm. and maybe end it there the same way some people want Messi to end it in at New, New, New World's Old New Boys. Boys yeah. uh, Saudi Arabia came out of the left field. Yeah. I was blindsided because I didn't see that coming. You know, Saudi Arabia, of course, People always talk about Messi going to... Uh, Messi fans have been loving this, by the way, because Ronaldo fans for the last two years had uh, been uh, mocking Messi for going to the Farmers League. Well, if yeah. France is the Farmers League, I don't yeah. know what Saudi Arabia is. So, But, you know, all that aside, I think I, I, I don't think it's a deserved ending. I think Ronaldo deserved better. But, of mm. course, I also think mock him all you want. I think Ronaldo has earned the right to collect this big payday. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's given fans enough joy. He's given fans enough euphoria over like, the course of his career. He's given us like, incredible moments that will hold and treasure. For, uh, even I as a Messi fan that will hold and treasure. He has, he has given me memorable moments against my own team. That's right. Barcelona, you know, remember when he scored and did the karma celebration. So for yeah, me, yeah. I think he has earned the right to collect big at the end of his career, and the, you know he has been mocked, but I don't think that matters. And uh, of course, there are ethical concerns when it comes to this deal, as normally they are with anything in the Middle East. You know, Saudi Arabia is not exactly a model country. You know, they whole thing with uh, Khashoggi, them slaughtering and murdering him in the embassy hasn't exactly been buried. Then this feels like them trying to sports wash 
Uh, they try to do it with the Live Golf Tour. Yeah. They have so much money to spend. And I feel like Ronaldo going there uh, almost legitimizes yeah. uh, Saudi Arabia in a way. And um, he's not the only one doing this because even Messi has a deal, I think, with Saudi Arabia to be their tourism ambassador. Yeah. And I think if you're, if you're a human rights activist, this is a very, very disappointing move from a human rights standpoint, the same way Messi's deal with uh, Saudi Arabia is disappointing from a human rights standpoint. Because if you think Qatar was bad, which I feel was a bit unfair because Qatar has almost the same human rights issues that other you know, countries with anti-homosexuality laws have. My own country, Uganda, has those laws. So I think Qatar has the same issues. But I think Saudi Arabia is even worse now. Because in Saudi Arabia, women are really like in Qatar, women don't enjoy the same rights that women in America enjoy. But Qatar, in its defense, at least tries. Qatar has three women in the cabinet, which is just two women fewer than Biden. In Saudi Arabia, women have just earned the right to drive. And so seeing like uh, a global icon, seeing like a great ambassador of the game like Ronaldo going to Saudi Arabia, for me as a football fan, extremely disappointing. But as I said, but as I said, he has earned the right to collect big, but from a player who was winning Champions Leagues just, you know, a few years ago, from a player who was playing for Manchester United at Old Trafford, the theatre of dreams, to now be playing in basically the retirement home, that's the Saudi League, that's, 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 that's such a downgrade, an epic downgrade. It's, 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 it's such a huge fall from grace. I think it's the most dramatic fall from grace since I left Qatar to come and do this podcast with you, George. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the most oh, dramatic, yeah. <laughs> such, such wow. crashing down for us, yes. <laughs> I miss you too, Joe. We uh, all so, do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, for me, obviously, I'm a massive Real Madrid fan. Ronaldo, I've said this before, has brought me a lot of joy. I wish that he was willing to take a little bit less money and embrace a smaller role to be at a bigger team in Europe because I think he could have been a big contributor off the bench for a, a team. You look at, Guys like Zlatan Ibrahimovic, you look at uh, Ed and Ed playing Jango. in his forties. At yeah, at AC Milan, yeah. accepting if you're willing to accept your role, yes. If if you want to accept the role, he could have he could have been contributing. And I know I know it's important to Ronaldo to be you know padding those stats that he likes to pad. You know he could have been more relevant staying in Europe with a smaller role. But I think that if he one of his you know must haves in his new contract was I'm going to play every minute of every game, then it would mean going to a league like you know in you know the Middle East or in MLS or something like that. So again, I'll, I'll, I, no. I'll, I'll say this though. We are, you and I, we are mortals. We are normal men. We are not gods. Yeah. So a player like Ronaldo, yeah. who has been the first name on the team sheet all his career, from when he was a kid, yeah. he was always the main man. He was the first option. He was the go-to guy. Mm. Uh, it can be a bit of a struggle to transition from that to being a bit part player. If you always enjoy top building in Hollywood, if you're always the first name that appears on the screen on a movie, it can be hard to become a character actor later in your career. So for Ronaldo to go from first name on the team sheet to now a bit part player, it's just, first of all, it's not good for your ego and your ego won't take it. And also, so I feel like we as mortals, we as normal men uh, might not understand why Ronaldo is not willing to accept his role. A player like LeBron James or a player like, you know, thank God, Michael Jordan, who retired the way I think Ronaldo should have retired, the way I think uh, Messi deserves to retire on a high of winning his sixth uh, chip. Th those players are not used to beat patrols ever. From when they were kids at the playground, they're always the best players. And so for them, it can be a bit hard to come off the bench and play two, three minutes or the last 10 minutes uh, in a soccer game, as the case may be. And so I think I understand where Ronaldo would struggle with that. Mm. And uh, I think like we, the fans who are normal men, uh, tend to struggle to understand where these players are coming from. But as you said, yes, he still has a lot to contribute, but he wasn't willing to one, take a pay cut. He wasn't willing to take a cut in role. And he also, more importantly, how many teams were willing to deal with him? Because Ronaldo comes with a lot more than just the football baggage. Okay. He's like a whole corporation upon himself. And then, of course, he did that interview with Piers Morgan. And that, if you are any coach willing to take a bet on him, to take a gamble on him, if you saw that, 
yeah. you would have gone like, yeah, this is a bit too much drama uh, yeah. for, for, for me to deal with. And so I think, I think that, that interview with Piers Morgan, I think just compl- complicated matters for him. Absolutely. And again, I would say, you know, for if you're like a, a work person or if you're a, a person who believes in uh, uh, sports icons being role models and all that and having to use the, their platforms for the force of good, Ronaldo moving to Saudi Arabia is not just disappointing as a human rights move, but it's almost disappointing as a trend I have noticed with Ronaldo recently. Like he seems to be hanging around or padding around with characters of questionable moral value. I'll put it like that. So he did the interview with Piers Morgan, of all people. And he, Piers Morgan, we all know his crimes are well documented. Yeah. Lengthy and well documented. Um, uh, then he was padding around and I think hanging around uh, Jordan Peterson, who is another character of questionable uh, uh, you know, reputation, if you would say that online. And then like, so I, I, I think, I hope, I hope, I, and I, I say this is disappointing, but I hope like next time we don't see Ronaldo hanging around Andrew Tate or <laughs> even worse, Salt yeah. Bay. Salt Bay for sure. All right, well, there you have it, everybody. I think that's going to conclude our, our latest episode of our podcast. Thank you all for joining us. Joe, it was a pleasure as always and look forward to doing it again soon. Tano fun, Joe, Tano fun. Until next time, my friend. 